up until recently, uh, with this pesky COVID, uh, I basically li lived in the Himalayas for nine months every year, and I've worked in the Himalayas kayaking, uh, selling adventure trips for about 20 years. Now, the title of the talk, I think, is something along the lines of, so I bought a flight. And uh, there's a lovely picture of me uh, outside a monastery in Bhutan as well, with an iPad in my hand. But the reason it's titled, so I bought a flight, is because that's how I ended up in Nepal. 20 years ago, uh, I just really wanted to go to Nepal, and I couldn't find a group to go with, and I couldn't justify spending money on a commercial trip. Now, as somebody that runs commercial operations in Nepal and Pakistan and India and Bhutan and Tibet, I should always say, please come on a commercial trip. But I, I was young and I couldn't really, I couldn't justify it. So I basically booked a flight to Nepal with a company, with an airline called Bangladesh Beeman. Uh, now, Beeman, I still use the airline uh, Beeman. Beeman buy their planes from Aeroflot when Aeroflot have finished with them. And I remember taking off that first flight. And you remember, the, for, those, uh, for those of us that are probably over 40, we might remember, you know the big TV screens you had at the front of planes? Uh, everyone's got into little ones now, but the big ones. As we taxied off and lifted off in Heathrow, the screen fell off the wall and hit the front row. And that was my first sort of flight out of into Nepal. I mean, I'd, I'd worked in Norway as a guide in the late 90s, and I'd paddled in Canada and across Europe as well. When I landed in Nepal 20 years ago, all I had was a scratchy bit of paper with what looked like a child's drawing of a chessboard, but it was really a friend's map of Tamil. Uh, it was the tourist district in Kathmandu. So when I landed and walk out of the airport with my boat, get my taxi and the taxi driver says, is it my first time in Nepal? And I was like, no, no, no. Knowing that if I say yes, he's going to charge me twice as much. No, no, it's not my first time. It's not my first time. And because I had this little sketch map, I knew exactly where to go, to which hotel. And I was like, you turn left here, you turn right there, you turn left, you turn right put my kayak in my room in the hotel and the room was called hotel star and it's not it's no longer there which is probably a good thing lots of the rooms were en suite but water never worked and so the toilets didn't flush so it was pretty disgusting but it did cost two dollars a night back then but I, so I checked into the hotel left all my gear and walked out into the street and bumped into a friend of mine called Hannah Paul who is a female, obviously with a name like Hannah, is a female kayaker. And she was one of the first sort of people, not just female, first people I knew that made a living out of kayaking. She took photographs for National Geographic. She traveled the world with a boat and yeah, just lived out of a dry bag. Now, one of the stories that comes from that trip is there's a river called the Marcy Andy. And I'm sure people that are listening to this have heard of the Marcy Andy. Some of you may know this story. But 20 years ago, to get to the Marcy Andy, you had to walk in, and it was quite a long walk. We were talking two days, two days walking with your gear, uh, which is a little bit like walking the shuttle on the train, to be honest. But we, we, we walk up to, the, to get on the go paddling. Uh, I've eaten some really dodgy food. Uh, on day on the sort of last day of the walk, which is something I still continuously do, but I do believe that my uh, insides are probably a bit more robust now. Uh, and we we paddle down. It's good class four four plus. We're boats that are twenty years old. Uh, well, not twenty. You know, the boats now are twenty years. I was in an Eskimo Quadro. Hannah was in a Dagger Redline. A guy called Chris Onions was in a Wave Sport Z. Wave Sport Z. And we set off. We camped the first night in uh, on the beach, River Right, after a rapid called Kiwi Cupcake. And over our sort of shoulders, as, we, as it were, looking over behind us, we can see Annapurna. We can see the sunset over Annapurna, which is beautiful. 
and a place to camp. Was that night we cooked some food, and if, from memory and looking through my diary before this talk, that night's meal was boiled garlic, boiled onions, and smash. Yeah, Alan, I can see your face, mate. Yeah, it wasn't a very nice meal, but I'd not bought the food. Out. Chris had bought it. So we had that. Anyway, three of us are laid down now on the beach. We have the tarpaulin over us. And I don't know how many people here have had the two-minute bubble warning. You know when you're asleep and you just have a little bubble in your tummy and you know that you need to get to the bathroom and you need to get there quick? That's what it was. And I'm laid there between Hannah and Chris and I get the, the four bubble warning. I managed to get out of my sleeping bag, but not out of my shorts. So the long and short of it is, my shorts ended up getting washed in the eddy at four in the morning and hung on the tarp to dry. I then get back in my sleeping bag and go to sleep. Seven o'clock in the morning, I have to get up again due to a poorly tummy. And I run down the beach, and as I'm there doing, you know, it sounds like somebody's turned a tap of rusty water on its oil, but I shout at Hannah because the Annapurna looks beautiful with the morning rays on it. And obviously Hannah works for National Geographic. So Hannah rolls out of bed and gets a camera out of a pelly case and clicks basically blind because she can't put her contacts in because she hasn't got time and stuff. She just clicks blind. And this is camera film. This is not digital. And there was a film got sent to National Geographic, a 36 exposure. Alan, you, you can know where this story is going, don't you? Yeah, I can see you nodding. Uh, so there's a 36 exposure that got sent to National Geographic of the sun over Annapurna. And in the foreground is me squatting. That was my first real taste of adventure in Nepal. It was all, that year was also the first time I did a first descent in Nepal. I looked at a map and spoke to people, local knowledge, uh, looked at guidebooks and went and did a river called the Buddha Ganga, which is in the far, far west of Nepal. It is an 18 hour bus ride from Kathmandu to the Gange, Nepal Gange, and Nepal Gange to a place called Ma Tadi is 21 hours on the bus. And then it's a day's walk into the Buddha Gandaki. Uh, the Buddha Gandaki is walled in, tight constriction river, probably no more than 10, 12 cubics, but it empties into the Seti Canale, which then enters into the Canale. It's a long trip uh, by myself with no beta at all. And I, that was the first time I, I paddled 13 hour days and I've continued to paddle 13 hour days on solo trips uh, up until last year. Obviously I've not been out this year. And I, I will do 13 hour days, which brings me lovely to a river in North India, which is called the Zarap Chu, flows into the Zanskar in Ladakh. The putting is 4,300 meters, which is high, which means that you really struggle to breathe and that your buoyancy aid gets tighter because foam expands, air expands in the foam and your buoyancy aid gets tighter, your helmet gets tighter. The central pillars on your boat distort the boat and you get on. It's 240 kilometers as a Zarapchu. The Zarapchu is class four, five box canyons. And if you watched a video by Nuria of her swimming on it, uh, that's done the rounds on Red Bull, I'm sure. It's class four, five, and then it drops into the Zanskar, which is a beautiful raft supported trip for another 120. So it's 120 on the Zarap, 120 on the Zanskar, uh, 240. And I've paddled that solo in a day and a half, but I've also paddled it with my friend George Younger in 20 hours and 50 minutes from put in to take out of class four or five. Now I'm gonna, people are messaging me on Messenger, I think. There are just people messaging me saying nice shirt and smile, but I want people to message me questions in the chat. So thank you very much, Ian and Rob. Right, that, that's that story done, isn't it? Do you guys 
you're gonna have to nod here or just put as soon as just got to put it into chat do you guys want to know how i ended up getting a job working in bhutan with steve just somebody nod or shake your head and i'll tell that story that'll do okay so obviously i spent a lot of time in nepal and i spent a lot of time in bhutan and uh I was invited into Bhutan it'd be about seven years ago now, and I was invited in by the king because Bhutan is quite a closed country even now, and it's quite hard to get in there. You can't get in there independently. You have to be in there invited on a tour, and I got invited in. And uh, paddled some rivers and spoke to some logistics guys. And then about 18 months, two years after that trip, there was a, a tweet by Steve, Stevie B. And he tweeted, looking forward to my next expedition, kayaking in Bhutan. And then a, a mutual friend of mine called Dr. Imogen Beer, who writes for BBC, BBC Wildlife magazine and various other magazines, she sort of retweeted that tweet with my name on it. And then Steve just contacted me and asked me to meet him to discuss kayaking in Bhutan. And I, I said, I, so really sorry, Steve, I, I can't, because I'm in, I'm in Bhutan now. This is before we all did everything by Zoom. I said, I can't meet you face to face. I'm in Bhutan now. Uh, and I'm going to Chile uh, in the uh, late November, early December. And I can't see you this week, you know. And he was like, are you flying back to Britain? I said, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm flying from Bhutan to Kathmandu, Kathmandu to Delhi, Delhi to London. And then I'm flying into Santiago from London, which my air miles that day were brilliant. And it was a really good commute. And uh, he said, OK, I'll, I'll meet you in Starbucks at Heathrow. So I landed off a plane from Delhi to get ready for a plane to Santiago. And we met in a coffee shop and it took us less than 10 minutes to decide that we were going to go to Bhutan. I flew out in the spring to recce the river get the permits organized, organize food, organize hotels, organize all that stuff. And then we flew out in the November to film it. For those of you that are working maybe as coaches or maybe work in insurance or working as guides and coaches, we work in risk assessments quite a lot. And my risk assessment obviously was quite intense for working on a TV company. Oh, so I'm told, I'm told that it was quite intense, but it was really two lines and it just said, this river will be class three until it's not. And that was my risk assessment with, it's going to take, it's going to be this long and it's got steep guard, guard walls. And once we're in, it's going to be really hard to get out, except in two places. That was sort of how it worked. Uh, it was, a, and it was a really good trip. You know, I'm not, uh, not diminishing the fact that we never finished it. It got finished a year later by an Indian guy called Manish Dhaka, who works for me, and another Indian guy called Serin Chotak, who was on the film. He's one of the support guys in the raft. And they went in in kayaks and they finished it off. So, Sophia, thank you so much for the comment. I'm sure people can see it. That's a dynamic risk assessment. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in dynamic risk assessments. I'm, I'm not a massive fan of static risk assessments at all. Uh, most of my risk assessments for my company are indeed uh, dynamic because I think the environments we work in and we leisure in and we adventure in are all dynamic. Uh, most of my expedition planning is on the back of envelopes and then it gets typed up. And, uh, but it, it mostly is on the back of envelopes. So that's that story done, isn't it? I suppose I should talk about the time that, you know, I went to school with the London bombers. I'm sure some of you know this story, but I'm going to say it again. You guys remember 7-7, seven, seven, don't you? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at the comments. 7-7 uh, seven, seven bombers. Now, I just got, from, just got back from Pakistan when, when that happened. Uh, the the seven seven bombing in London, and I got a phone call from either the Daily Mail or Daily Telegraph. I can't remember which one it was, asking me if I knew, you know, a lot of a lot of names, and I said no, I don't, I don't know, them. I don't know. Them. And they're like, oh, it's the it's the London bombers. I said, well, no, I'm sorry, I don't know them. 
and they were like, well, you sat next to them at school. Now, that for me was a big jump, obviously, no social media back then, really. And what the journalist has done is it got it worked out where the where the bombers lived and what school they went to. And they went to Batley Boys High School. And my name is Darren Clarkson, DC. So when I sit at school and back, you know, school in the 80s and early 90s, you always sat in alphabetical order. The guys were in the same class as me. I would have sat next to them. Now, what that in itself is quite strange, but what's also really strange is my dad was always late for his trains. And that day he was working in London and he missed his train. And the train he was supposed to be catching was the train that blew. So he went for a coffee and then watched the bus blow and then decided to drive, get a higher car and drive home. The guys also went rafting on the train. Well, I've got a season ticket. So why the police didn't interview me, I don't know. I spent a lot of time in, in Gilgit in Pakistan, which is where their training camp was. Now, for those that have not been to Pakistan, I've made it sound like it's, it's a horrible place full of sort of terrorists and warlords, and it's not. If you are really into whitewater extreme kayaking, at the moment there's a lot of people, uh, some Europeans actually have just come off the Indus, off the Rondu, but Pakistan has got some absolutely beautiful class two, class three whitewater. And the river called the Gilgit, it starts off, it's called the Gizar at the start, and then it, and then it becomes the Gilgit. And it is at least 11 days of class two, three, with a, quite a small section, maybe 30 kilometers of class four, five. So out of your 11 days. And what's amazing about that trip is you can run it without raft support and you can hotel every night in Gilgit. You can drive up, run a section, you know, drive up early morning, run a section, drive back into town, go back to the next section, drive back into town. You do it in 10, 11 days. It's a beautiful place. Pakistan is an amazing place to explore. Relatively safe, uh, despite what our media tells us. And despite the fact that you can buy shoulder mounted rocket launchers and grenades in the local shop. When you drive up the Karakoram Highway, uh, obviously it's a beautiful, beautiful highway, quite a, quite a busy highway, the Karakoram Highway, a busy highway. And I believe there's a life lost for every kilometre of road, on the, every kilometre of road that was built on the Karakoram Highway. But as you drive up, you have all this Buddhist carving on the side of the road, interspersed with graffiti, modern graffiti. And the modern graffiti is always inappropriate, uh, always welcome to Mohammed's car spare shop, Royal Pindi. You know, just adverts, billboard type adverts, but with spray paint. And every so often you get an advert for a shop in Bradford or Birmingham or Leicester, or wherever. You just drive up, and it's obviously a family connection, and somebody's put that on the side of the Calcom Highway, which is just insane, really. Now, let me, I'm just trying to jump around in my head, really, for trips. We've got the fact that kayaking down Everest is pretty cool. When you start at base camp on Everest, and you're near 6,000 metres, uh, the river, especially in Tibet, when the, the river's called the Rongbuk Chu in Tibet, and it, as it comes off Everest Base Camp. And the river is so new that as it comes out of the lake at Base Camp, it, the rocks are still moving. So when you get out to scout, the line you see is not the line you will paddle. Because the rock, because the river is so new that the boulders continuously move, which makes it quite in, intense, especially at that altitude. And uh, yeah, so that's the wrong book too. And then in Nepal, you've got the Dudkos in the Aran. I guess you guys and girls know about the Dudkos in the Aran. Uh, nice class five trips that get done. Uh, so I think there's only one person in the world that's done all the rivers on Everest and K2 
He has a shocking, shocking taste in Hawaiian shirts and wears his hair a little bit like Qui-Gon Jinn tonight. And then that same paddler has also paddled all the rivers off Everest solo into Nepal. But you can probably do a, a Google on that and, uh, and read a report or see a video. Oh, thank you very much, Sophie. Darren, can you fly your kit to base camp? Oh, I like this one. Or do you have to carry it up? Right. Thank you so much. Because I know I'm rattling, really. I've got so much stuff in my head that I want to talk about, and I don't know what you guys want to listen to. Right. When you paddle from Everest on the Tibet side, on the wrong book side, you can drive to base camp. Well, I say you can drive. You can probably drive all the way now. But when I did it, which would have been 2000 and five, six, something like that. Uh, you can drive, ooh, Dave James, that's another one. Right, uh, yeah, so you can drive up to Rongbuk and you, you can park up just outside Rongbuk Monastery and then you get a horse and cart to take you to base camp. The horse and cart takes you a couple of hours, uh, one horse, one cart, one boat, takes you up. On the Nepal side, when you do the dud cozy, you have to fly to Lukla. Now, Lukla is possibly one of the most dangerous airstrips in the world. For those that have not been, it's uh, that sort of angle with a dog leg. It's got a 90 degree dog leg in it. And uh, so you've got to put your boat on a little plane and fly that up there and then hope that the, the plane lands at Lukla. I did speak to an American pilot who flies simulators a lot for training. And he was saying that whenever he flies Lukla on a simulator, that he crashes and kills everyone. Uh, he was a commercial pilot. So you fly into Lukla, then you have dun, dun, at least two, if not three or four days walk with your gear. That's if you do the dud cozy. But when I did the Aaron, the first time I did the Aaron was 2002. And that was a 21 hour bus ride from Kathmandu to a village called Kadbari. And then it was a six day walk from Kadbari up to a village called Num. Now, Num is not base camp, but Num is as close as you can get to navigable, up to a navigable put on. People have tried to go higher, but the Aaron, the Aaron is actually the wrong book too. It's the same river. And as the wrong book too comes out of Tibet, it falls off the Tibetan plateau. And uh, we all have, you know, the vision of, is it uh, Atlas holding the earth and the water cascading off. That's what it's like when it fall when it falls off the plateau. It just falls in cascades of hundreds and hundreds of feet of like, you know, 100, 200 cubic of water cascades. Now that itself is beautiful to watch and pretty insane, but you've got to put it in numb. So it was a six day walk in, but when we did that in the early 2000s. And on the last night before we put on, we got arrested by, Maoist terrorists, who, if you guys don't know, Maoist terrorists were like guerrilla freedom fighters in Nepal with big knives and AK 47s. And we ran to the river the following day. Uh, on day three of the trip, we had, it's class five gorge by the way, on day three of the trip, the gorge opens up a little bit and we heard gunshots. And I remember paddling with Craig and I said, Craig, what do we do? You know, I've got gunshots. And he, he looked at his watch and Craig went, I think it's lunchtime. And we sat and we waited for the gunshots and we went to the gorge wall side where the gunshots were coming from, figuring that they couldn't see us, you know, because of the gorge wall. And then we paddled out, it took us three days to paddle out. It transpires that the Maoist that had seen us uh, robbed an Italian Spanish climbing party and they robbed them naked. They robbed him in Numb, which was two days after we saw them. Uh, like I said, they robbed him naked. So they took all the cameras, all the money, all the rucksacks, all the clothes. And they blew up a police station. They killed a teacher. And that was the gunshots that we heard. When we got back into Kathmandu after three days in a night bus, a 30 hour night bus, uh, Kathmandu was on curfew. And uh, it was pretty tricky. And, the whole of Nepal was on curfew because of it. Now, the Maoists now, and the situation in Nepal now has, has settled down, the Maoists are actually in power, and it, it works really well now in Nepal. You, you no longer get 
pressure cooker bombs in trees. You no longer get uh, people trying to extort money off you. I mean, you, you do get people like trying to extort money off you, but that's just the way of Catman do. And uh, you don't get people, you know, block road, doing roadblocks and stuff like that. Uh, questions at the side, one from Dave that says, have I many paddling, paddling injuries? I've broken my ribs uh, twice at paddling. Both times doing silly things. Uh, both times actually on uh, north in North Wales rivers, and the time that matters uh, is this, the last one, and it's, it's you can't see, but it, I can feel my it's my lower rib. I always have my river knife in my buoyancy aid pocket. I'm not a fan of having my river knife on the outside. Uh, and I remember coming off the Nant Gurid slabs. I don't know if anybody's aware of the Nant Gurid slabs. They're the big slabs that run down the down to, down the Gurid pub uh, at the bottom of Snowden. You've got the glitters, and I'm looking at Dave nodding, because if Dave nods, then I know that I'm explaining it right. Uh, and you, as you come off the slab, if you're just slightly offline or you get kicked, there's like a, a rock that sticks out of the water. And as I came down and landed, the rock that sticks out just caught the bottom of my, my buoyancy aid. But because my knife, which is a we use Gerber, is quite a big knife uh, in a sheath, you know, it's that size, then it pushed the knife and its sheath into my bottom rib, even though I had a buoyancy aid on, and that's what broke my bottom rib. Now, would that injury have happened if the knife had been on the outside of my jacket? No, but could something else have happened? Quite possibly. Uh, it's a risk assessment that I still keep my knife in there. Although I do, I have moved its position now. You know, I said I have a different jacket and I have moved position. But I did paddle all that day and all the following day. And uh, without realising that I'd done my, done my rib. Uh, the, the first time I broke a rib was on the Colwyn in North Wales as well. Which, If you're going to go kayaking in North Wales, don't do the Colwyn. It's just it's a waste of a day. Don't go do it. It's in the guidebook. It's just a waste of a day. Uh, you're either going to spend a lot of time portaging, a lot of time scouting, or get injured. Just don't do it. Right. So then I've got Ian. In chat, he's called Indy. He's called Indy because he went to India once and he won't stop talking about it. Yeah. In the right, Ian. I know you've got your mic muted, mate. That's fine. Uh, hey, about the Stikine. Yeah, the Stikine, it's a river in British Columbia. Big yellow sign says, don't go in there, it'll kill you. Takes three days, it's 60 kilometres. That's it. Uh, it's been done in uh, It's been done in one day. It's been done twice in one day by Benny and Gerd and uh, Annie Ol when they had a chopper to fly it. The Stikine is possibly the hardest river I've ever done and the river that is filled with more magic than any other river on earth. It's got amazing deep, dark gorge walls that close in. At Entry Falls, you've got 25 foot high waves that you have to ride over before you make the line. If at Entry Falls you do not ride over the first 25 foot wave, you get typewritten into a hole on river left. And you've got to work out of that hole and you then enter this big large V at the bottom of the 25 foot wave at entry falls and you track right like your life depends on it past the big gauge rock and the gauge rock's bigger than my uh, bigger than my village i believe and then you've got waves that are 20 and 25 foot and there's about eight of them in succession crashing on you crashing and rolling and tumbling and as you paddle down the river gets tighter and tighter and the gorge walls get higher and higher You've got amazing, amazing rock sculptures, mount, white mountain goats that dance on the rim and can sort of free solo. The Alex Honold, you know, look like he's a beginner climber to these mountain goats. And they go up and down. After a draining four to five hours, absolutely draining. There's a guy called Nick waiting to get in. I think he's my boss. Uh, <laughs> there's... After four, a draining four to five hours, you get to the first campsite, and the first campsite is Site Z. And Site Z is the site of a proposed hydro project, which the, the First Nation managed to find, and it, you know, it's stopped now. The rapid before that is Wasson's Hole. Wasson's Hole 
if you do not penetrate the eddy line at the top to get the eddy to scout, you have to run it blind. The eddy line is at least 10 foot in diameter with big guarding boils. And as you penetrate, if you try and penetrate that eddy line and you're too slow, it will mist remove you and you will surface just above the lip of Wasson's. Luckily now, Wasson's is so, show regu so regularly on clips that you can run it blind. Not, It's not advisable, but I ended up running it blind. Now, I was very tired, and, but it's no excuse for missing any. But you, you run it blind, you either run it sort of hard left or hard right, and hope that you don't end up in Wasson's hole. Because as John Wasson says, the lights are going to go out and you're going to go really deep. And then you get to Site Z. Now, Site Z has been run, but if I go back to the Stikine anytime soon, I'm going nowhere near it. The portage over these huge boulders takes a lot out of you mentally and physically, and it's the longest fall I've ever made portaging because you've got to try to portage in high or portage in low. And I portaged high and fell around 25 foot sheer, like slipped, uh, twisted my ankle a little bit, which goes back to one of Dave's comments, and, and got on at the bottom. Uh, you have to make this a must make ferry glide out the bottom of Site Z, and you ferry glide out with all your might because you want to go nowhere near that par over at the bottom. The, that second day on the Stikeen is is hard. It's the hardest day out of the three. And you, you camp on River Left after Garden of the Gods Rapid in Wolf Track Camp because there's wolf tracks uh, on the beach. You camp there. And then the second, the final day, you paddle Garden of the Gods. You paddle Scissors, the wall. And then there's a rapid called the Hull that ate Chicago. And then there's a rapid called V Drive. And V Drive is really the last rapid in the gorge. It's, it's amazingly steep, amazingly, amazingly steep. It is a huge V tongue that drops off into a big lateral crashy hole. And then all the water then pushes into an undercut wall on river left. The portage, if you are portaging it, uh, you can, so at some water levels, you can portage river left, uh, but to get out of the eddy is immensely difficult. Uh, and at other water levels, you have to portage off river right, which means an abseil of about 60 foot. Now, most people, I don't think, have 60 foot, well, 60 foot abseil ropes in the backs of the boats, especially when they're on committing trips. So most people do run it, and they, you just don't want to swim there at all. Uh, if your deck blows on the stikine, you, you're in a whole world of pain. Uh, and then you, you float out of the bottom of the drive, and you've probably got the length of the three rapids at the mill on the D. So from the little rapid at the top of the car park to the wave at the bottom, you've got that distance between the bottom of V drive to the last next rapid, which is Tanzilla slot. And Tanzilla slot is no more than six foot wide. And it is the end of the canyon, end of the Sticking Canyon. Uh, going through that slot, there is possibly the best part of three, 400 cumix flying through that slot. So it's really deep. Uh, for those that don't know, if anybody doesn't know what a cubic is, cubic metre per water per second, it's a fridge. So it's like 400 fridges going past your eye line in a second, going through that gap. That's that, that's probably about right, and people are checking their heads, but I think that's right. If I've done my maths wrong, and it's not a fridge, and it's more like a microwave, let us know. But, so that's the sticking. Then there's two really big rapids as you leave there. Uh, that have got names that I don't want to repeat because I can't see all the guests on here and I don't, and I hope there's nobody under 18 uh, because the names are not necessarily suitable. So you've got two big, huge rapids after that uh, and big whirlpools that will, even on the flat, that will suck you up down. Now, the Stikine is a river that pulls at your heart. When people get motivation to run the Stikine, it wakes them in the night, and it did for me. It woke me for years, years and years in the night, wanting to run it. And it wakes me now because of what could happen in the Stikine, even though I've done it. And I'll, I will go back and do it again, I know I will. But it wakes you in the night constantly. 
it is the long as as stikeen paddlers will tell you it is the longest loneliest road as you drive up highway one out of vancouver up, up into northern british columbia on the alaskan border the there's a big bridge at the putting huge big bridge it's a metal bridge and you sleep under the bridge at the putting and the bridge roars with traffic in the early hours and it's almost like a, a ghoul you know it's waking you up at like four in the morning as these big like juggernauts and logging trucks fly past and it just roars at you and that sets the scene for the stikine it's not like any other river i've ever paddled it's a, a magical place okay next question this is the last one i've got so if people want to do fire questions put some more questions on that would be lovely uh okay paul fletcher's question hi Daz. how did you progress from club paddling to raising your game and getting into exhibition paddling i had no friends is a simple answer paul so i was a club paddling and i paddled with pennine canoe club and the roots are still going and it's it's brilliant that they're still going and they're still bringing people into the sport and it's an amazing thing now my mentor at the club who sadly passed away a couple of years ago was a lovely lady called marianne spender and she would always take me and my friends off paddling and my friends turned into polo players and some dropped out and i think at a certain age you know like maybe 15 16 when you learn you know i learned at 14 ish i got my first sport about four but when you get uh, but still hear me wave if i drop out i've just done a thing flash to say my internet's about to die so if i do die i apologize but you guys can still hear me because when you wave you can, perfect that's sorry i just it flashed up to say my internet was dying uh, i guess it's the weather outside anyway you get you know 14 15 16 you kayak if you don't have the passion for kayaking i think other things sort of get in your way like drinking mad dog 20 20 on park benches and girls because that's what happened to a lot of my friends, you know, that they found Mad Dog 2020 and girls and they stopped paddling. And I carried on and I went from a club paddler to being at university to paddling what we now call as now call freestyle, but it was called rodeo and hot dogging when I was younger. Uh, and I was in the GB rodeo team. So I went from that into being a, a bit of a rodeo paddler at uni. And me, in the, those days, people that paddled rodeo were also river runners. It wasn't like a separate discipline. And people talk about Nepal, people talk about paddling the Glen, people talk about Fleda, people talk about I stepped up my game by going from, you know, slow, making slow steps, really slow steps, you know, from being a beginner paddler where I couldn't do a sculling draw on my left hand side. I don't even think we teach that anymore. Like I was a hybrid skull on my left, I couldn't do it at all. Uh, to being on the GB rodeo to then, like I said at the start, just booking a flight, which takes me back into the town, just booking a flight and turning up in a country, which is what I did with a boat and a load of gear. That's what I did. And then from there, realizing that I actually quite like suffering. You know, I quite enjoy sitting in a boat for long hours, eating rubbish food, sleeping in sand, wearing dirty clothes. I quite enjoy it. And I'm just sort of pushing myself further and further with that. And I, I'm lucky in that the, up until uh, I started Pureland Expeditions that I had a job that I could take sabbaticals on. So I'd take a, at least a three month, if not a five month sabbatical every year, which was quite nice. And uh, I'd, I'd work half a year and then I'd travel and explore the Himalayas for half a year and guide. And then I'd come back and I'd do the same. And, managed to buy a house in North Wales and stuff like that. And then obviously then started a company, which I'm not going to talk too much about because this is with Dave and not all to do with me. And then, <laughs> you know, I, and then I basically moved out to the Himalayas and lived there a lot. And now with COVID, I'm back working at social services because I can't live abroad at the moment. Well, that's fine, isn't it? You know, and we take local adventures. And, you know, I'd really like to discuss with you, with everyone really, what we think adventure is. Because over COVID times, I've had some of the best adventures I've ever had. You know, I've been open boating. I hate open boating, but I've been open boating. Yeah, I, I hate it. Uh, but I have been off open boat. I live in Wales, so I can go paddle with friends, but I've been open boating. That's really nice. I've started running, which is, which is super cool. And uh, I did a river today that I've 
with some friends that I can't believe I've never really done before. I did the fling with today and I've done it. It's like super close, isn't it? And I've never really done it. I've done the Glen Lows. Oh, uh, thank you, Dave. I, it's nice when these chats things come up. And uh, I have got an SUP, mate. Yeah, an SUP. It's like paddling an ironing board, isn't it? But yeah, ad adventure matters, doesn't it? Adventure matters. And I think what we, what I have to do is understand that what I think is adventure and what maybe you guys think is adventure is maybe two separate things. Or we've all have a different understanding of what adventure is. Then, you know, for me, I book a flight and yeah, I land in a country and I eat back. I eat bad food and sleep in ditches and stuff like that. And that's adventure, but in the, I've got an eight-year-old nephew. If he walks up Kinder Scout, that's going to happen. And I think that's something we can discuss openly at some point uh, over campfires or you can put comments in. Yeah, Dave's got to find his sup. Uh, what else we got? Right, Rob Slater, do you find your current running bug is imp improving your paddling fitness? No, it doesn't, Rob, because I'm inherently lazy. Uh, for those that have watched me paddle or have uh, paddled with me, I tend to paddle a lot like a T-Rex. For those, uh, you know, like when you paddle kayak or kayak paddles, you know, if you've got a bench shaft paddle, your hands are supposed to sit on the bend. And mine don't. I'm at least two, if not three hands in from the blade to the shaft joint so my hands are much closer and when i put my pad when i put my hands down nearly all the time my hands will sit just my thumbs will just rest on my cockpit rim which is you know really it's like that it's really close now obviously people like dave i'm sure as coaches pick me up on that because it's not good technique you know it really isn't you should have a lot more yeah, stuff but people will pick you up but it, it does me fine for long days uh I, I do use a bench shaft paddle although why i don't know because i have my hands so close but my little fingers uh can just sit on the bend especially if i use my letterman the little fingers to said it just does release a little bit of the pressure and uh yeah that's it because we find me another question or oh, i can rattle on about another trip i can talk about the alsec if you want do you ever want to hear about the alsec if uh alan put your hand up because i can see you in front of me do you want to hear about the alsec mate just wave perfect okay <laughs> the alsec right Ooh, that's i'll come back to that what scares me i like that right the the alsec for those that don't know the alsec the alsec is the river that gives alaska its name okay it is a remote river in Alaska. It requires a float plane from the takeout. You can put in quite easy at Haynes, you put in quite easy and you paddle down. And the ALSEC is 11 days of hell and purgatory. It's, it's cold. On day three, you get to Lower Lake. Lower Lake. Yeah, I'm sure it's called Lower Lake. Uh, my memory is not what it should be. You get to the lake, uh, big glacier, uh, icebergs in the lake, wolf print on the beach, uh, bears, and a load of wildlife that could kill you. But the river itself, like I said, is 11 days. It's all really nice, class two, three, paddling through icebergs, which is, you know, relatively nice. You just can't make any eddies because the icebergs tend to move quite a lot. And then about halfway through on day five-ish, you get to a, a section of rapids called Turnback Canyon. Now, Turnback Canyon was made famous by Walt Blackadder in the 70s. Walt Blackadder did a reconnaissance on it and he soloed it, soloed it in a 16-foot Letman composite kayak with a set of Iliad paddles. There's a book called Never Turn Back, I don't I think I've got it here. A book called Never Turn Back, uh, well worth reading. It's about Walt Blackadder's descent of the Alsec. And it is, it's a, it's a canyon. Uh, the right-hand bank wall is in the on the glacial moraine. And it's really cold. It's about 500 cubics. And it's class five plus and you can't scout it. 
And if you decide to portage it, you're walking over a glacier. So people tend not to scout it and just paddle through the middle of it. And it's, it's not very easy. In fact, it's very difficult. The on the if you do decide to portage, the portage will take you two days over to walk over the glacier and the glacial moraine, where there will be bears. So if you are portaging it, you need to have a gun. We we had guns on that trip, uh, little pistols, in the in pally cases in our boats. I don't believe that those guns would have killed a bear, but they would definitely would have scared it a little. We come out as you come out of turn back, you've then got four days ish of class three, class two, beautiful, you know, beautiful, beautiful remote wilderness with bears on the banks fishing, it's like a John West advert. And you get to the takeout, and if you're organized, then you know where the airstrip is, and if you're not organized, then you don't. And you end up paddling way past it and having to walk back for two hours with dragging all your stuff back to the airstrip because you can imagine the airstrip's in the bush it's not signposted is it it's just a bit of sand in the bush so we ended up missing the airstrip and walking back and then we spent the night sleeping on the airstrip waiting for our float plane to arrive to collect us that we'd we'd booked and the, that night the the local fishermen there they were commercial fishermen catching salmon uh, on the on the airstrip they've got big holding tanks for the salmon and we managed to have salmon cooked over an open fire as a rubber borealis shone on which sounds beautiful doesn't it but i'm a vegetarian and i was shattered after all that kayaking so i didn't even see the rubber borealis properly so i fell asleep and i didn't eat very well. i didn't eat at all that bad i said i didn't eat at all i think i had some sort of muesli bar and everyone else had salmon and when the when the pilot came and landed in the morning it, it must do not for kayakers because it's not a very well known river but for fishermen it must it does that flight quite a lot so he flew in and with a load of beers for the guys which also works really well but i'm teetotal so i didn't get that now there were six of us on that trip three two brits uh one brit this next part and then three yanks now getting six people and six kayaks in a float plane is really tricky. Uh, originally, we planned to tie them on the outside on the skids. It was not a float plane, sorry, a, a small plane. Uh, we tried to tie them onto where the, the little wheels are. Uh, I just got confused with the the, the Sitna because that's a float plane. The uh, we we put the boats inside, but we could only put four in, and then we had to wait at the air at the sort of little air depot for a couple of days until he flew back in with some more clients for fishing to pick the other boats up. Which is fine, you know, waiting around in a little town is fine, you know, waiting for your plane, for your boats to come back. What's not fine is the fact that on the LSEC, like a lot of rivers in America, you have to take your waste out with you. And that includes toilet waste. Now, if you're in a raft, you can have an ammo box toilet and that's super easy. But if you're in a kayak, it's quite difficult to take away your poo. So we took it out in black, in, uh, black bin bags, refuse bags. And 11 days worth of poo in your black bin bag in the back of your boat is not very pleasant. Especially when that boat is then left at the airstrip for a couple of days until it flies back. And then it, it's really not nice when you forget it's in the back because you obviously you've entered it all out, but you forget it's in there and you don't realise it's in there until you're parked in a Walmart car park, getting ready to go to Willow Creek and you have to put it in Walmart's bin. Which, cheers, I'm so, so pleased you're laughing there, people. I mean, not that I've ever done that at all. You know, no, it wasn't me, nothing to do with me. Now I've got another, what scares me? Oh, I like that one. Is that, let me see, what scares me? Right, yeah, what scares me? Uh, I used to say nothing scares me. I used to have a really strange understanding of fear. Uh, I understand anxiety and I understand being anxious on rivers and trips and expeditions, I get that. But I had a really, a really sort of strange understanding of 
what scares me because I never really got scared. I got that nervousness, you know, the butterfly stuff you get. I got that, but it was never at the level of uncontrollable uh, fear. The way I sort of like it is when you're a kid, you're a teenager, and you try to chat up your first girlfriend or your first boyfriend, and you're absolutely petrified that they're going to say no. Okay? And you've thrown peanuts at them and you've pulled pigtails and you're getting nowhere. That, that there, I was more scared in as, as a young teenager of rising with, with girls than I am about paddling five. Because paddling class five, for me, there, there are sort of uh, options. You know, you, you can paddle to the bank and climb out a lot. You can recce. Or, as, as Willie Kern has always said, water's really forgiving until it's not. You know, like, water, and Willie and Johnny lost their brother, Chuck, but they still believe that water is really forgiving. And it is. I mean, water's pretty forgiving, you know, like, even when you're paddling Class 5 in the remote locations, as long as you've got the knowledge about how to read a river, then that's fine. It's about not... Not taking undue risk, I guess. Which, but if you take an undue risk, that's when you get scared. Now, I think we can all agree that COVID is pretty petrifying, really. Especially, you know, the first lockdown, that was pretty scary, wasn't it? Now, we're sort of used to it and we've sort of settled into it a little bit. And I'm in Wales, so I'm not in lockdown. You know, I can go out paddling with mates and I can have a coffee and stuff like that and you guys are all locked down. Now, we're sort of so used to that now that the sort of fear factor is less, is diminished. And I think that's the same when it comes to kayaking for me, you know, the more I do it, the less that fear factor sits there as like a, a driving force. I got on the Glen this weekend and I paddled the Glen a lot. Uh, I paddled it super, super high, paddled it low. I've done it a lot. And this weekend was the first weekend in a long, long time when I had to follow somebody to check my lines because I've not paddled it properly since February. And the local guys that live you know, in Conway and Betis have paddled it a lot. But although I live on near the Maudach, due to lockdown, I can't go across you know, county borders to go paddling up there. Uh, so they've paddled it a lot and I've not paddled it. Paddled it. So I was asking, uh, I was a little bit nervous. And uh, I've tweaked a muscle in my leg, so I'm a, I'm a bit slow on my feet walking down, which affects your confidence and all that stuff. Uh, what we got here could be worse, could have stabbed yourself with a frozen. Oh, right then. Losing rivers to dams. Yeah, it's a damn shame that, Ian. Right, yeah. We've lost a lot of rivers to dams. Nepal has lost a lot, a lot of rivers to dams. Like the Marcy Andy that I spoke about at the start with uh, Hannah and Annapurna and what have you. That that campsite that we were on is now under a hydro. That's gone. The boat of Coors has got yet another hydro. That's gone. The Balefi's getting one. Um, the Canal of the Great Bend is getting one. Tibet's pretty much annihilated with hydros at the moment. Bhutan has got hydros, but Bhutan is obviously quite sensitive to its environment. Excuse me. And you don't see the hydros. They don't affect any white water not that white water tourism is a big thing and they don't affect villages and they don't affect the ecos up there because they do service properly uh which i think a lot of people don't that's just that's pretty quick there getting all scares me yeah 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 thank you very much alan you gotta go now but thank you very much mate it's been a pleasure uh, anybody want some more stories i could talk about this sitna because since i've mentioned the uh the asset this is sitna there's a sitna or the big sus, as it's called, is in Alaska again, and that requires a float plane to fly in. So you're flying on a float plane with your boats and you land on a lake and then you bushwhack down to the putting. And at the putting, the river is a, just under a kilometre wide, which is really wide. It's probably four, 500 cubics. The first rapid there is called Devil's Creek Rapid. Rapid, you camp on the right hand side at the putting. There is a hole on Devil's Creek Rapid, uh, holes halfway down on River Left, that is at least 30 foot on the face of the pile. 
and the hull has got a one in four mortality rate. Now there were six of us on that trip and we avoided that hull like the plague. Uh, if you do go in it, there has been a lot of fatalities in there. And the Susitna is a deep gorge. It's really exposed. The scouting is very, very difficult. The waves are 20 to 30 foot high and they continue to come and continue to come. The eddy lines are at least uh, 20 foot in the core and you paddling loaded boats. It took us two days, but I know people it's taken four or five. Uh, and then at the takeout of the Susitna, you climb out on river left after two hours of flat. Uh, there's a railway bridge. You climb out on the railway bridge and you wait for the freight train to pass. And the freight train passes at 4.20. And you have to get to the railway bridge before 4.20. And the, you can't book a ticket, you just have to flag down the driver. And because this is Alaska, you can bribe him a little bit. And uh, you sit on the back and you, it's a little bit like boxcar willy. And you, you sit on the back of the fur train with all the coal or what, lugs or whatever and rattle along. Uh, yeah, I've just got a message here that says we're coming to an end. And that's lovely. I didn't talk about the Himalayas a lot. I just spoke about a few and I spoke about Alaska loads, which was brilliant. Because I don't often speak about Alaska and British Columbia. So that was ace. And uh, Open some mics and we can talk some bobbins if you want. Yeah, how is everyone? Are we done? Do we work? Thank you so much. Oh, Ian, thank you so much. It's been fab. Cheers, Sophia. Uh, where's my next paddling destination? Ogwin. <laughs> Ogwin, I might go to the Glen. I've got, I can't go. Uh, I've got to go to the D. I'm paddling there. I'm paddling on the Dean a few weeks. It'd be great if you guys, you guys are not open by then. It's, it's sad, really, but if there's any Welsh paddlers on here, come along. A friend of mine uh, had leukemia a couple of years back, and when he was getting his chemo, he was in the next chair, was a young lad with leukemia who was now going blind. But I'm taking even a, a, a topo duo down the D, so that'd be awesome. The, the, this lad that's just recovering from leukemia. Uh, in the front of a topo duo down the D. That'd be amazing. Right. Anyway, anybody else want to just fire me some... Just give me any question. Do you guys know... I got a I got a pen yesterday that can write underwater. I mean, it can write loads of other words as well. But... Oh, cheers, Natalie. That was, that's, I'm, I like it when people laugh at my rubbish jokes. Okay, um, I think this is going to go on for, 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 for a while um, and I'm sure people are going to stop on uh, and chat to you, Darren. But I'd just like to say, you know, because some people are starting to leave now um, because this is the time we normally end. Thanks ever so much. Uh, no problem. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's been thoroughly interesting. And um, <laughs> could I just ask one last question? Of course you can. What, what is your definition of adventure? You see, I don't know if I have one. I don't know if I have one. Definition of adventure. I'm sure that there's a book somewhere. I mean, I might even have one there. I've got research methods for leisure and tourism. It might be in there. Uh, people tell me that I'm an adventurer, right? Or that I'm an expedition paddler or I plan trip, I plan expeditions or I plan adventures. But really, I just hang out with my mates. Or not. You know, like I do it by myself. So maybe... An expedition is when you realise that your home life is not what you want it to be and you need to leave for a little bit, you need to check out for a little bit. Maybe that's what adventure is like, you just need to check out for a bit. Then, I don't know. But you can have adventure anywhere, can't you? Can have, you, know, you can have adventures. There's a wood at the back of my house, I love going in there. It's an adventure in it, you know. So you don't have to book flights to go on adventures, you don't have to you know put yourself in environments that are necessarily scary for adventure you can have doorstep adventures and i think doorstep adventures are brilliant you know i think as we as we get comfortable within the the adventure arena if we're using those words the adventure arena then we can stretch what is normal for us we can stretch from you know when i was a kid and i'm old enough to remember that you played out until the street lights came on and then you came home and your mum and dad would say, or my mum and dad would say, 
uh, yeah, you can ride your bike, come in when the street lights come on, don't go past the end of the cul-de-sac. And I was always the one that went out of the cul-de-sac to the next cul-de-sac, and then the following night went to the next one, and the following night went to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and came back and got told off, and my brother never did. Which might explain why my brother works for the government, and I don't. You know? So I mean, maybe adventure is just pushing your boundaries a little bit, and the more you push, the more you get confident, uh, and the more you push, and the more you get confident, and that's why it expands. So it expands from, you know, walking up bleak low to going up K2. I don't know. Or you just piss about with your mates, which is what I tend to do. That's it. Find me some more questions, people. Are we, are we done? Nobody else. People can turn mics. Open your mics and ask a question if you've got a question. It, it, otherwise, I'm going to say thank you very much. And yeah, can I? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jump in? Hi, Steve. Hi, it does. Uh, I just want do, do you uh, do any mental preparation before you go on a, on a big paddle? I've been called mental. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do I do any, that's a nice bridge, that mate. Where are you? Is that a year? Uh, <laughs> Basil, it's amazing. <laughs> it's cracking, mate. <laughs> right, mental prep. Uh, no, I don't. I, do, I sort of do, but it's just the way I live, tend to live my life. You know, so COVID's been a little bit... Uh, I've got a nice message I'm going to answer in a second, uh, but I'll go back to you. Sorry, Steve. The, I, I do quite like to live tenderly, like to be aware of my actions and the, the how I sort of interact with the world. Right, which I know I can come across as quite sort of a straight talking Yorkshireman and I'm not that serious all the time, but I take that into the expedition planning. So, an expedition doesn't have to be successful for it to be successful. Okay, you know, you don't have to reach a conclusion for it to be successful, right? So, you imagine the story I told about the Maoist terrorists and on like day six of the walking and all that stuff, yeah. Without those being there, that expedition would still have been a success. Would have been a success. It would still been a great trip. But the fact that happened means twenty years later, nearly, I've got a great story to tell over Zoom. Mm. You know what I mean? And it affected that trip. You know, if we'd have got to that river and we'd have broken paddles and somebody'd have swam, that's not a failure at all. It's just an outcome that you you don't you didn't plan for. You plan to finish it. But it's not an outcome. It's an outcome you didn't plan for. You don't have to plan for outcomes, Steve. You don't plan for outcomes in life. Why do you have to plan for an outcome on a trip? You just like just do it. You know what I mean? So your success criteria doesn't focus just on the success of the overall trip. It's no, not at all. Pleasure. Not at all. So I have no when it so obviously I was quite uh, blase about the fact that I've soloed the rivers of Everest and nobody else has done it. I sort of went past that a little bit. But the, the criteria for that solo trip was, it was actually financial because Berghaus paid for it. But mentally, it, the not finishing the trip was all right. If I'd have started the trip and been, had to bail out because it was too difficult or injured or whatever, it wouldn't have been a failure of a trip. Financially, it would have been for Berghaus. They wouldn't have liked it. But for me, it wouldn't. It would have been, this is a story to tell when I set off to do that trip and it didn't work but it's the story that matters we live in you know the way we live our lives we, we live in stories if you think about mm. life as a story you know stories are boring if we know the end right and if we don't know the end halfway through and it puts a little bit of adventure in there doesn't it and i like that so that's that's the way i don't sort of see the, uh, trips like that you know i quite like a bit of the unknown in the middle you know there's a trip I did on the Zanskar, and I know that Indy, who keeps popping up, he was on this trip, and like halfway down the Zara, Zanskar with Ian, uh, I bought a cricket set in the market, and I played cricket halfway down, and then carried on paddling. And that's like, you shouldn't write that into an, you don't write that into an expedition plan, do you? But when you see it in the market, and you buy it, and then you have a game of cricket before breakfast, and then, you know, it adds to a story, and it becomes part of the trip, and that's how it should be. You know, life, people take life a bit too serious sometimes. Cool. Cheers. Yeah, cool. Right, we've yeah. got. Uh, I've got one from Chund from uh, from Chunda, I think. Yeah, Chund. Scout movement and my involve six. I think he means involvement. 
which had made more sense gender. So yeah, scouts. I st- I did even although I started at Penang Canoe Club, scouting gave me the taste for kayaking because when you're good scouts and you do a bit of kayaking, don't you? you do a bit of climbing, a bit of caving or whatever it may be. So I had done a bit of uh, kayaking in scouts. I'd done stuff in an old Europa and fiberglass gables and whatnot. Uh, and I'm quite lucky that a couple of years back I got invited to be a scout adventurer, which means that somebody that looks a little bit like a homeless Santa can put a scout uniform on and I go to scout groups and talk about adventures in the same sort of las and fair way that I've just spoken to you a lot. Uh, and it was really nice because I got recommended to be a scout adventurer by Bear. And I've never met Bear, but he was the one, him and Steve, this is before I even met Steve as well, really. Uh, him and Steve put me forward and I never scout adventure, which is really cool. Uh, I tend to do two, and I will go and do a talk to beavers or scouts or, or cubs. Oh, I'll go to a camp and just be there and sort of tell stories around campfires and drink tea and, and just be there. And it, scouting is really good for that. Uh, I think it's brilliant. I mean, I, I know scouting has got some, or has had in the past, some image problems. Uh, but I think we all well know that. We're not going to go into it. And scouting is amazing. And I love it. Uh, I've, now I'm back, actually. I do a lot more for scouting than when I was away because I've been away. I couldn't do it. So what other messages have we got now? Uh, well, uh, Simon messages, Daz, how do you get into the right mindset for paddling day after day in stressful situations? Are some days, uh, are there some days it's harder to do? Is there a trick you use to reset when it's difficult? Right. So day after day, stressful environments, I, I, I'm i really good at breaking down days and I'm really good at breaking down situations uh, on the river. So when, for example, when, I'm, when I solo the Zarap, which is class four, five, box canyon stuff, and while I know the river, I also know the difficulties in it. So I can break that down into, okay, once I get through box one, I know there's an eddy on river right. Well, that's familiarity, isn't it? I know there's an eddy on river right. But if I didn't know the eddy was on river right, I'd be able to go, once I've got through this box or this section of canyon, that's when I'll reassess and I'll just break it through, like move by move or hour by hour, kilometre by kilometre. You know, going in and doing first descents is, for me, is all about time. So I break down the hours. And if not the kilometers, because breaking down kilometers on the first ascent is just futile. I break down the hours, so I'm like, okay, I've paddled for an hour now. Okay, we can reset, we could put that hour behind us. Okay, I've paddled two hours, we could put two hours behind us. And that's how I work it. Now, if it's, if obviously, if your crisis, I don't know if you guys know the crisis graph, uh, where crisis danger opportunity graph, you know, where you have an escalation and then you fall off the back of it. As long as you can keep it at baseline or just above baseline without the escalation phase, then life's really good and you can bring yourself back. It's when you have an issue where you freak out, and uh, let's use the word freak out, I think we all know what we mean, you know, you panic too much and you can't control those baselines, that it becomes problematic. But if you can bring it back to simple things, excuse me, <coughs> you know, like I know that by four o'clock in the Himalayas, I need to be looking for a beach because I've probably got another two hours before I really need to camp. So little things like little milestones, okay, now I'm on the beach, I need to get firewood, blah, 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 and so on and so on, and I can bring that back. Obviously, some days are much harder than others. The days when you've got flat water, believe it or not, are much harder than the days when you've got white water, because white water, you're keeping your mind occupied, and you physically... Although, you know, if you, although you're tired, you might be hungry, you, you still have to think, but on the flight, you don't have to. And uh, in in my experience, it's the rapid that comes after the flat. So if you've got days of flat, uh, Humla Canale, for example, there's, there's a long flat section after you come off the Humla before you drop into the Canale. Uh, there's a long flat section, and then you hit a big rapid on the Canale. And although you've run bigger rapids days earlier on the Humla, you've had this long section of flat where your brain sort of turned off a little bit. 
and then that, that mapping on the canal it seems really difficult although it's not uh, it just seems it due to the fact that you know you've, you've sort of turned your brain off a little bit right let's see what other questions i've got uh, you've started panel with scout brilliant 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 with all panel with scouts uh, but many many years from now where would i choose for your final ever oh final ever paddle oh that's a good one that isn't it i like that wouldn't it be nice right i've never had that question before but wouldn't it be nice to have your final paddle on the first white water river or flat water river you ever did with the people that taught you wouldn't that be nice i mean it's, it's unlikely uh because i think the people that taught me as like i said marianne passed away but it'd be nice to go back to that first white water experience or that first lake experience or whatever it may be and uh and just reconnect with the people that showed you that kayaking can be cool or you know if you're open boating or whatever it may be that you can actually do it i mean if somebody had told me at 15 that i could make a living out of kayaking i would have probably taken a slightly different academic life but i do make a living out of kayaking up until this year which is pretty cool but yeah i think going back into into the river that sort of got me hooked would be amazing i've even i've just got uh over the covid i managed to buy a couple of boats before prices went silly and i've got i've got a topo again because that was the boat that took me from class three to class five and then i've got the boat after the first ever kept my first ever cartwheeling which was a pre on hurricane so i've got a hurricane as well and uh just because it's nice to go back in and remember the boats that you learned in i've managed to get an old set of paddles or set of werners that i used to have before uh 90 degree, 90 degree offset 205s must pick it up on ebay and it's just nice to go back and remember where you came from and uh, i did have a gabo Olympic mark 5 in gold glitter but sadly i sold that well, what's next <laughs> How he feels like he's the one that's not been involved in scouts. Don't worry about it, mate. You're fine. Uh, that's it. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, that's all the questions. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been lovely talking to you all. Obviously, it's just like doing my podcast. And uh, if you listen to my podcast, that'd be ace. It's on Podbean. And it's just like doing this, but I don't have faces on Podbean. I just talk to myself. Can you, can you put the link up in the, uh, in the chat for us, uh, Darren? Uh, I, I don't know if I can. Hold on. Keep talking. What's we really talking? I'll try and find it. Because <laughs> I'm not very good at this. As you, as you'll, uh, as you'll know, I'm, I'm a bit of a technophobe. But yeah. Uh... So while while Darren's uh, finding that, um, we've got a pretty pretty well full program now till uh, the. Um, the end of February so uh, there's yeah. a few people um, uh, on here today that are talking um, next oh, week cheers Harry mate you beat me to it <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week we've got uh, De say Del Reed um, the following week uh, Ollie uh, Sanderman I think he's here What's so yeah there? he's still here um, and uh, then we've got the, the, the pin-up boy of British canoeing Chris Brain um, uh, Adam Robson, then we've got our Christmas quiz, and then into the new year, we've got a few authors. Then we've got uh, Daryl Shaw from British. Oh, authors! Have you got authors? Yeah, oh. yeah, more authors. Um, well, then we've got. Did we buy a book for Christmas? <laughs> then Sophia's going to tell us all about risk assessment, <laughs> and uh, hopefully, she's going to carry cover those three magic words must, should, and could, which. Uh, <laughs> it's all class three until it's not. All class three until it's not. Yeah, she will now, Dave. <laughs> Can I be the pin up, pin up person of insurance then? <laughs> you, want, you want to be the pin up lady of, of British insurance? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay I'll, I'll change the post um, on here and, and put that on. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. Um, and then we, we, I think we've got some, to me, I think we've got some exciting ones coming through. We've got somebody from the John Muir Award talking about, uh, obviously, the John Muir Award and what they do. And then we've just had uh, somebody from British Canoe and from the Access and uh, Environmental team have agreed to come and speak. So 
that's where we can ask these questions about what are British canoeing doing to stop the dams and the hydros ruining our rivers. <laughs> I'm not prompting any questions there, but maybe somebody would like to ask those questions. There you go. It's funny, I can, I'm, just, I'm just deleting it. Everyone, I had a few people send me messages on my phone that I've just looked at. So if I didn't answer your questions because they went to my phone, then you should have put them in chat and I, I'm not going to answer them. Is that it then? Are we done? Cool. Yes, if no one wants to ask me any more questions. appreciate that. Speak to you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, it's awesome. And thank you so much, gang. I'm sorry that I'm on. It wasn't linear at all, but that was fine. Have a great night, everyone. Don't get too drunk. Okay, I'm going to hand over to uh, to Lewis and Nat as as, as normal, and uh, I'm sure they'll and Steve will be there and Simon. They'll be up to the early hours talking rubbish. I need to use another word, didn't I? <laughs> Don't look like that, Steve. <laughs> okay, well, bye, everybody. This was. A With Dave production.